and not just quadratics, right? Because the last section, we're doing quadratics are just U-shapes, this way, that way, you know, not, it's kind of boring, right? But we do know there's curves, right? So how, you know, how are these graphs, you know, created? And, you know, how do you graph those in general, right, when it comes to it, you know, without a graphing calculator or without, you know, some program to do it for you, right? So that's what we're going to be learning in these two sections when it comes to it, okay? And again, like I said, it's going to be lots and lots of um, um, rules and applications that help you out when it comes to it, okay? So the first part is let's suppose we have this function here. Okay? And now what we want to do is we want to find the number of sign changes we have in f of x, okay? going from left to right, just like we read. Okay? And we're just going to check. So if I go here to here, so that's a sign change, right? I go from negative to positive, so that's one sign change. And it doesn't matter if I go from positive, negative, negative, positive, it's a sign change. That's all I care about from one to the other. So I go from positive four to positive eight. So there's no sign change there. So I'm not going to count that. And I go from eight to negative one. So that's two sign changes so far. Okay. And then from negative to positive five, so that's another sign change. So a total of three sign changes in f of x. Okay. Everybody clear on that? No confusion there? OK, good. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same thing. However, we're first going to plug in negative x and then see how many sign changes we have there. Okay. So when you plug in negative x, um, the easiest way I always do when it comes to like the negative x's is if it's an odd power, the sign will change. If it's an even power, the sign will not change. So for example, since it's 7, right, the, it's an odd. So therefore, this sign is going to change because of that. So now it becomes a positive 3x to the 7. Again, this is just a shortcut because, you know, or it could get kind of lengthy trying to figure out all those portions, but it's just a quick little shortcut. So again, 5 is odd. So therefore, it's going to change. Um, this is even, so it's going to stay the same. You know, this is technically an imaginary one there, right? So one is odd, so that changes. And now we have a five. Okay. So before we go any further, everybody comfortable what I just did? What it means by plugging in negative x and just doing that first. Very good. No confusion. Okay. So now that we did that, now we're gonna do the same thing. Now we're gonna again see how many sign changes we have. Here happening. I'm sorry. So the last number, because it doesn't have. Uh, oh yeah. So it doesn't have an x. So it just you know it will not change because you know nothing happens. Just stays the same. Whether it was minus five or plus five. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be negative five billion. It's still going to be negative five billion because you know you're not plugging anything in to affect that number itself. Yeah. Good catch. Right. Thank you. Right. So now again, just from here, how many sign changes we get? And again, just count. So we get from positive. To negative so that's one sign change negative to positive that's two positive to positive so none and then positive to positive so none okay so in f of x we had a total of three sign changes in f of negative x we had a total of two sign changes now if you wonder why do we care about this well it's a good actually question when it comes to it the reason why is this very special rule here, okay? It's called the Descartes' rules of sign when it comes to it. So it says, let f of x be a polynomial, okay? The number of possible zeros is either the number of sign changes in f of x or is equal to that number less than an even number. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The second one says the number of negative zeros is either the number of sign changes in negative f of x or again equal to the number less than an even number. Okay. This is uh, the most difficult of the scenarios we're going to be dealing with because, you know, this portion right here. This is kind of confusing uh, as well. And then when I first taught this class as well, I was like, well, what, what does it mean? I always get confused. Like, what does it mean by the number of even itself? Okay. But we're going to break this down. Okay. So we're going to have a total of three zeros, three positive zeros. So if we actually break this down using the exact division, all that fun stuff, we are guaranteed to have three zeros. 
three positive zeros, or now here's the key thing. So we're going to have scenarios. So for this situation, we're going to have three or now here's a fun fact. Uh, what is a number that's even between zero and three? Any number. Two. Two. So that's what you mean by we're going to subtract three by an even number two. So what's three minus two? One. One. So that is how this situation is saying, is whatever it is, and you can subtract every even number between zero and that number itself. So for example, okay, let's suppose we had five sign changes, okay? So between zero and five, we have the even numbers of four and two, correct? So therefore, I'm gonna subtract four and also two. So five minus four is one, and five minus two is three. Does that make sense for everybody? Did I lose anybody? So we're gonna base it off of the amount of sign changes and after yes. that, I just follow the rule. Correct. So it's either gonna be this one or any subtraction of the even numbers. So, or one or three, because again, this, this meant by subtracting four, and this was from subtracting two, right? Those are the only two even numbers between zero and five. So again, that's the tricky one. So Descartes' rule sign is the most trickiest of the ball. And you'll see why we care about this uh, in a little bit, right? You can say, why do we even do it? You know, it's kind of confusing, um, but it, it narrows stuff down uh, when it comes to it. Now, the good thing is the second rule also is the same, but now we're using this instead, okay? So it's the same process. So in this example, we had a total of two. So we're either going to have two or a subtraction of an even number between zero and two. Well, the only even number there is is also two, right, itself. So then two minus two gives you zero. So what this is saying is we're guaranteed either two negatives or zero negatives. Just like over here, this we're guaranteed either three positive zeros or one positive zero. Again, uh, once we put everything together, it'll make a little bit more sense. But again, as of now, it's just a little tricky when it comes to it, okay? So any qu initial questions so far? Again, we'll get into uh, examples in a little bit using this rule. Kind of get it? As long as you kind of get it, that, that's, that's all that really matters um, when it comes to it. The next one is called the rational zero theorem. And this was a little easier to deal with, so don't worry. So this one says let F be a polynomial. And so this is a, you know, a random polynomial. So you could think of like, this is our example there, okay? Where the first and last numbers are not zero. So like the first and last numbers are not zero, right? So negative three and five are not zero. Let P1, P2, B3, and so forth be the factors of A sub naught, and Q1, Q2, Q3 be the factors of A sub n. Okay, so we're going to look at the last numbers in our polynomials. So that one and that first one. So we don't care about anything between. We're going to look at the last and the first number. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to factor each one completely. Okay, so that's what these P1s. And these Qs are all about, okay? So we're just going to factor. So like if it was an 8, we're going to list all the factors of 8. If this was a 100, we're going to list all the factors of 100. Okay? So that's what it represents, okay? Then the combination of P sub n over Q sub n are the all possible zeros of the polynomial. So what this is, the theorem is telling you is, I'm giving you all the possible zeros of the polynomial to graph it, meaning we don't have to do, you know, guess and see, you know, does this work, does that work? We actually can give those actual numbers. So we can solve for this using this type of process when it comes to it, where in general, it's almost impossible without, you know, some techniques on a, a graphing calculator to deal with, okay? Now, the way I always memorize this, just to help yourself out, is I always say, um, what was it? Um, last, divided by first, because the factors of the last number are divided by the factors of the first number, okay? Um, that's just one way I've always memorized uh, how to do this. If I, you know, if I didn't look at the theorem, it's always last divided by first, and that's how we're gonna deal with these possible zeros, okay? 
Okay. So lots of theory, you know, now let's do some applications so you can see how this will work out. Okay. So let's do the first one. So we're going to list all the possible zeros. So in other words, we're going to do this, use this rational zero theorem to help ourselves out. Okay. Okay. So first off, we want to write down our last number, which is going to be negative six, and our first number, which in this case is two, or a sub n. Right? That's it. Next up, we're going to list all the possible factors of each one. Right? So let's do the first easy one first. So the factors of two is just one and two, right? Those are the only things when you multiply, give you two. Now, what about six? Well, I can have, again, one and six. Or I can have, what else? Three and two? Yep, three and two. There you go. Now, here's in the trick. Let's just look at two. So one times two does work. What about negative one and negative two? Does that also give me two when you multiply? Yes. Yeah. So therefore, what we're gonna do is we're actually have double as many factors than we had before, because plus or minus also work. So all of these are be plus or minus. So we have far more uh, factors to begin with when it comes to it. Okay. okay, so now that we have them all set up, let's list up all the possible zeros we can have. And how this is gonna work, it's gonna be always last number, divided by the first number. So all of these numbers divided by these ones. And it's a combination. So again, the easiest way uh, I always do this is this. So we're gonna start with plus or minus one over the first one, plus or minus one. Next, plus or minus one over plus or minus two. Okay. And we can keep going. So now we do six over one plus or minus six over plus or minus two and we keep going so plus or minus three over plus or minus one plus or minus three over plus or minus two and then finally plus or minus two over plus or minus one and plus or minus two over plus or minus two so we think holy moly this is a lot to deal with right when it comes to it. But the good news is some of this is repeated and some of it we can simplify, right? Because this right here is just one, right? Plus or minus one, it's just one over one is just one. This is the fraction of one half. That's just six. Six divided by two is three. Right? And notice this is also three. So we don't have to re repeat that. So that and that is the same. We have plus or minus three over two, plus or minus two. And again, two over two is one, which we already have. So really, that's our real list of possible zeros after we simplify this down. So we have a total one, two, three, four, five, six, or 12 total possible zeros we can have. So that's how you do this, is how you use this rule here, this theorem, when it comes to it. So again, any initial questions so far in the first example? Okay, so in that case, let's try another one, give you guys more practice, okay? So let's look at B. All right, so last number is eight. First number is one. Okay, and then next up, we're gonna list out all the possible factors. And the good news is, there's only one for one, right? Which is the best part. And then for eight, well, we have four and two, and one and eight, right? Those are all that we have. Okay, so now again, it's going to be these numbers divided by that number. And if you notice, right, it's just going to be, if it's a plus or minus 
4 over 1. That's just going to be 4. So we're just going to have plus or minus 4, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 1, and plus or minus 8. So again, these are the possible factors, the possible zeros. Yeah. Any questions on B at all? Is everybody comfortable? Can I have you like a test question? What was that? No, it's been sarcastic. Oh, yeah. Oh, can this be a test question? Oh, who knows? It might be a quiz question, right? That we get comfortable with them. So who knows, who knows? All right, now let's go on C. So C is very similar to A. So we have three and six. So last number is six. First number is three. Again, we're just going to write them all out. So we'll just do the easy one first. This would be three and one. And then six we had on top earlier. So I'm just going to write that down. Right from there. Okay, so here is your first extra credit portion. So go ahead and uh, simplify this out. And in the chat, go ahead and uh, after you simplify, what are your possible factors? And you don't have to put plus or minus, just put the number with a with a parenthesis near to it. Okay, so go for it. He has another minute to finish up. Okay, All right, so let's finish this up. So, e plus or minus one over plus or minus one, plus or minus six, oh, I'll make it plus or minus one over three. So once we simplify all of those down, right, hopefully you notice you get a lot of repeats, which is good. 
So it's a lot of one to, to look from. We'll have one, one third. This is six. This is two. This is three. This is one already, so we have that. This is two, which we already have. And we have this two thirds here. Okay. So good job. So any questions just being able to list all the possible zeros? So, no, everybody comfortable? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you're wondering, if you're wondering, well, if you're wondering you know, eh, this isn't too bad. Where do you, why do you say this is going to be long? Well, the reason why this section is pretty lengthy, it's not because of the material. It's because the actual questions itself. So the whole point of what we were just doing is to list, to write out a polynomial into its factor form. So remember, a polynomial in factor form will look like this. So that's our goal to make it look like, you know, you can see it, right? So our goal is to make it look like that, right? To break it down individually. And we're gonna be using these rules to find those values that do make it uh, exactly that, okay? So in order to do that, there's a couple steps how you wanna apply this. So to find the zeros of the polynomial,